Right, so thank you for coming to uh, this session on building the cooperative cloud. Um, we've got a really great uh, panel. Uh, not only are they experts in their field, but they're also very punctual because we all uh, got together at 8 a.m. this morning for breakfast. So um, they're both punctual and uh, uh, very knowledgeable on, on this space. So, um, so uh, essentially, we've got uh, Wuta from the Free Knowledge Institute who's going to kick us off. We've got Chris from Web Architects. Uh, we've also got Alexander and Sophie from Happy Dev, uh, who are going to uh, be presenting about their, what work they've been doing around uh, building a cooperative cloud, so looking at the tools and the apps that can help um, facilitate, coordinate, and, and build a, a, a co-op economy. So I'll uh, start uh, with Wouter. Thank Good you. Good morning. My name is Wouter, uh, Free Knowledge Institute, and... Frempo Comuns, the We Make Commons cooperative that we set up in Barcelona, co-founded. Um, well, let's, let's start. I'm sorry Apple is so user-friendly. Um, the first thing, why we do this, of course, I'm not going to bother you all too much with the digital capitalism model that we all despise because they are collecting our data and then give us some services for free. Um, fortunately, we have the European Parliament that, after Cambridge Analytica went mainstream uh, knowledge, they invited um, Mark Zuckerberg to come to the Parliament, right? You remember, in May. And this is what happened, right? Euro European parliamentarians that should protect our citizens' rights, they, want, they were so happy that Zuckerberg was in Parliament that he accepted the Parliament's um, um, hearing to participate, then they wanted to make selfies with him. That was, that was so great. <laughs> so, in 2017, January, we came together with 10 uh, organizations um, that all work for digital sovereignty, free software, open standards, uh, cooperatives, and non-profit organizations. Together, we shared these worries. Like we know that we, don't, we shouldn't rely on these GAFAM platforms, but we still do, many of us. And we still use Google Drive, and we use so many of these services, right? So what can we do about this? So we, we talked about this, and we said, well, we should do something. We built some kind of commons-based platform. We started to use this working title of commons cloud, and we started a, uh, an online working group on that, and we worked like in parallel like online a little bit in the international sphere, but especially in Barcelona. And then we had some co-creation sessions uh, with users and people that were aware of, of the problems and that wanted to do something different. Um, and we all had been using tons of different free software web applications for years and years, but we also were clear that there were some problems with them, right? So on each platform you would have to register a new user account, you would, it would be difficult, it is difficult to collaborate, co collaborate between the different platforms. And then we started to experiment, experiment with Sandstorm, uh, CloudRun, and these kind of solutions that make it easy for, uh, to, to manage, uh, to have a self-hosted instance with different free software applications, but still, you have like, two dozens of different user interfaces. That was not what our users really were, were capable of, uh, of working with, right? With so many user interfaces. So, after a long process, we decided that we would set, limit it ourselves, at least at the start, with three basic platforms. Three software platforms. One is the office, where you can share Documents, contacts, calendars, share them or just use them for themselves. And if you want, you can share them, right? Project management platform where people can work together uh, around different tasks, projects, different tools. And a debate platform, we call it the Agora, where people can discuss and take decisions collectively. We used free software platforms. The next cloud, most of you will know it. Who knows next cloud? Right. Who runs its own instance, next cloud? 
Right, that's what we saw, right? Most people don't want to run their own instance, even if they're capable of doing so. It's better to get together with a large group of, or some group of people around some shared resource. The, for the project management, we use Fabricator. It's used by the Wikimedia Foundation, by the KDE Linux, for example. Large communities. It's, it's comparable to something like GitHub or GitLab, but it's not only software oriented. Right? You can run uh, your teams, make them open or non, more private, more hidden. Uh, you can have your tasks, you can have shared passwords. You can do that everything self managed, and even the sysadmins cannot access your, uh, your team resources if they don't want to. The Agro is based on uh, Discourse, very frequently used uh, online community platform. Who knows Discourse? Who knows Fabricator, by the way? Who knows? Fabricator, uh, PH, the one with the I. Not many, right? Well, few. Um, and we have made a, a web client so that people can access to register themselves and um, have one user account to access these different services and the future services that we want to offer. That's based on LDAP, because that's really uh, easy integrate, integrated in many of the existing software infrastructures. So we center on the user, where one user has one account and one vote, if you want, right? And they can be connecting to these three public services that I just mentioned, the Agora, the Office, and the Projects platform, but also they can be part of different collectives, the different cooperatives and organizations that are already forming part. They will be getting different instances, different servers with their specific office or debate platform. Right? So with one account, they can access all the different services that they belong to. So th that, that's really important for us so that we can grow this organically together and at the same time people co-own this. I'll get to that later. So from the beginning this is designed for decentralization. decentralization. We discussed about it this morning with a group of people who share this. Uh, some of you are here in the audience. Um, our idea is actually to have three types of interconnected nodes in this decentralized network. One is geographically, like the first cluster is in Barcelona, that's already operational since this month. We went live, we had a lounge in the middle of the, what is it, 11 and 12 of July. And that, that's, so that's territorial based, so we can have different cities, different locations where people can set up their own cluster. Second would be thematic, say a school wants to have their own cluster or um, a big event, it's some important user base huh? wants to have their own infrastructure and then they could connect to this. Um, and of course, existing other projects, like we have here, um, like the Happy Devs or uh, Web Architects or others, right? That we can interconnect with. That's a challenge, so we have to explore how we do that. But at least uh, at the lowest level, the LDAP structure is there. Um, and in, in our Commons Cloud, people have a user account, they can be co belong to a collective, and a collective can have different services. So, and from there, we can symbolically link the different accounts from one to another cluster. We are cooperative. Uh, the cooperative is called Fempo Commons, as I said. We make commons, and that's a multi stakeholder cooperative. We have workers, collaborators, and users or consumers, right? Those are the three. Um, and we do this as a, we co-produce the Commons Cloud as an alliance. As I said, we started with these 10 organizations. Uh, they are here um, in Barcelona. That's the, the Barcelona cluster. 
they contribute at the ways that they can. Some more research, some more developers, some more socially, some more on the training, uh, the workshops that we provide or the awareness raising sessions that we do. And we are now inviting the users to join because we had a crowdfunding campaign earlier this year in the spring and we doubled uh, the minimum that we had set ourselves so we got almost 13,000 uh, euro uh, to get started that's not much um, but at the same time it's helpful and so the, the the contributors and other users that are joining they can have a free account but we con we ask them to make contributions voluntarily so we like uh, very much well yeah this the combination of donations and the um, fixed commitments like monthly fees for those people who want to have access to specific services. So basically what, what, uh, what I showed you before, these public services, especially the projects and the uh, debate platform, the Agora, those are like freely accessible for anybody who registers for an account. But if you want to have uh, access to the office or to other value added services then and especially the collectives they will have to make a monthly contribution or periodic, periodic contribution to make this whole sustainable right and they can become co-owners for 10 euros months deposit they can become co-owners of the cooperative and then decide about the about the cooperative itself and about this project the commons cloud We think it's really important that we build a sufficiently large user base in each place, in each cluster. If we just continue to work alone with small groups, really small groups, then we cannot make the jump and really take on uh, the large digital capitalism platforms. I think that's really, really important. And I think the cooperative model is the perfect match with digital commons and cooperativism. So we try to make it open and platform based. That's it. Let's take the jump. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, thank you for Walters for the um, introduction there. Uh, we now have Chris from Web Architects who's going to talk a bit about what Web Architects are doing in this space. Okay. Um, so, Web Architects is a small multi stakeholder co op based in Sheffield. There's four workers, uh, about 50 um, client members, and um, we have the possibility for investor members, but we haven't got many of them at the moment. We're, we're quite skint. Um, we've been deploying the same software um, as, as, as the other people on this platform. We've been using Nextcloud and Discourse, and we've been making the code to set the servers up public. And we're in a network of tech co-ops, um, Cotech, and in the UK that's basically got pretty much all the tech co-ops in the UK are now in this network and it's been going a couple of years and we've been experimenting with this software in this network. So we've got our own um, uh, discourse server which is like a web-based discussion board that anyone can join at community.coops.tech. Uh, um, we've, we've quite a lot of us in, um, in Cotech have been using GitLab which is, GitLab is a, um, a competitor to GitHub that has a key difference that their source code is, is free software. So anyone, you, you can just use gitlab.com or you can download their software and run your own server. So um, our co-op has got a GitLab server at git.coop and anyone who joins our co-op can get to use that. And we've got a number of other tech co-ops have joined our co-op specifically to, to share the use of our, our GitLab server. Outlandish have got their own GitLab server. Agile, two of the other big co-ops in Kotech have also got their own GitLab servers. And um, yeah, it's, it, it's been interesting. And it's interesting that, that, that we've been de 
doing similar stuff as other people in kind of parallel, and, and, there, and there's also been some differences. And this morning at the breakfast meetup, I discovered that Happy Dev in France have been setting up their, uh, uh, have set up their own chat server using XMPP, using Prosody. And coincidentally, just this last month, we've done exactly the same thing. And um, we've now got um, an, an open um, multi-user chat room as part of our next, uh, Cotec Nextcloud server. Um, so you can join the Cotec channel at um, public.office.coops.tech. And um, we're hoping we'll be linking up with the, with the people in France and in Spain and working out how to take this forward. Um, all, all the uh, provisioning of all our servers for running these things, it's all been written in Ansible and it's all publicly available at, at, at git.coop. Um, we, we as web architects run about half a dozen Nextcloud servers for clients and about half a dozen discourse servers for clients. And discourse has got a very, it's very easy to, to join a discourse server, get join in with the conversation, it's very easy to use, it's very user friendly, it's basically the best web-based discussion forum software there is available at the moment, and it's great. Very low entry. Nextcloud, it, it really takes someone tech, you need, I think you re, at the moment you really need someone technical in your organization to be convinced that using free software and having a little bit of pain to get everything working is worthwhile. We've got a couple of clients that um, have rented Nextcloud servers off us, one of which have decided to ditch it and go to G Suite, and another one's decided to ditch it and go to um, Office 365, Microsoft, so Microsoft and Google. And I, and I think, I mean, I haven't had a detailed conversation with those clients as to what exactly was behind this, but my feeling is that they haven't had anyone very technical in their organisations who's been able to help them through all the glitches and ensure that all their client devices are set up properly. Because although with Nextcloud, it's, it's, you know, so my Android phone and all my immediate family's Android phones are all set up so that our contacts are all synced to our family Nextcloud server. We've got a shared calendar on our family Nextcloud server and all our devices sync to it. If any of us take a photo, it's all synced up to our own private next cloud server and it's all working well and all working properly because you know I've spent the time to make sure everyone's devices are all set up properly and everyone's desktops sync, sync to it as well. Um, but if you haven't got anyone in your organisation who's, who's willing to kind of patiently make sure all your client devices are configured, it's, it, you know, you're going to need some external help and um, so, so uh, that's, that, that, that's one of the, the things that, oops, there is to, a, a hurdle to get over, I think. Um, and, and, and another thing with Nextcloud is, there's quite a lot of add-ons for Nextcloud. It's, it's nothing like WordPress, where there's far too many add-ons that, that, you know, you, you can never even look at the whole list of them, and, you know, it's just endless. So, so Nextcloud's got a more limited range of add-ons, but they're not all that brilliantly integrated with, with Nextcloud. So, so, so the kind of the, the JavaScript chat add-on and the talk add-on, there's overlap between them, and some of them um, you know, are quite hard to get working properly. All right, Harry, you wanted to? I just, I just wanted to point out that um, obviously Nextcloud is free per user, so, there's, so while a small company might be able to say, okay, we're going to use Google Apps for our five employees, that's not feasible for a mass organisation like a trade union or a political party, where being able to give, them, give people those organising tools without incurring a seven pound amount of charge per person is essentially it opens up new types of potential organising. Yeah, that, that's right. So, um, so say, for example, you're a charity or something like that, and you've got a core group of workers that need to share a core group of <clears throat> documents and resources, but you also have volunteers and you want to be able to ha allow them to access some of your stuff. 
you can create user groups and you can have different groups with different levels of access and, and you're not limited you know you can create as many accounts as you want there is no there is no per account pricing as, as Harry said it's you you've just got to pay for the server resources and the maintenance of the server um, so I think I'm going to leave it there and we can hear what happy dev are up to <laughs> Uh, thanks, Chris, and we will hopefully have some time for some questions, but uh, before that, um, Sophie from Happy Dev is going to uh, talk about what they've been up to uh, in Paris and beyond. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sophie. I'm a UX and UI designer, freelance. I'm also an associate member of uh, the Happy Dev network. Happy Dev is a network of a few hundred freelancers in France. Um, I'm here today with Alex here and Sylvain over there, and we are here to present our new co-op uh, starting blocks. Nowadays, uh, we all want to create an app, but as you most of you know, I guess, um, today most of these apps are built in silos. So basically, you give them your data, they own it, and only them can exploit it. And yeah, it's closed, basically. With this system, only the biggest one, the most powerful, um, get to, to win the market. It's either uh, you're the monopoly or you go bust. So in most markets, there's only one main actor, uh, which we think it's, uh, it's a shame. So. I think it is time now to cooperate. Um, there is an alternative to this model. We can mutualize uh, our users, our members, and the data, and we can um, share all these data among all our applications. Uh, we're here to help you uh, with that, with starting blocks. With starting blocks, you can create your own collaboration app in only one click. <laughs> Pretty easy. <huh? laughs> Basically, you pick the components you need uh, and you build your app. We built a set of autonomous components, different functionalities such as team chat, uh, profile directory, and yeah, governance, organizing events, and so on. And you just pick the components you need and you build your own platform according to your needs. You can even build your own components later on. It's really like a, a customized tool. Mm. For example, this is an example of an app that we built with starting blocks. It's uh, the um, uh, platform we use at AppyDev to collaborate. We use it for a lot of things. Uh, we use it to post new offers, to uh, organize events, to find profiles, to message each other uh, for basically everything. Everything is in there, it's only one tool, and it's really, really helpful. So this is one example, but it can take many other shapes. Uh, obviously, starting blocks is open source. Um, and yeah, the new standards of web data today allow us to connect uh, applications together, starting blocks applications, but also outside applications together. And we, as a cooperative um, ourselves, we believe it's the only way to compete uh, with the upper system, the upper model, I would say. So, yeah. Let's break the silo and <laughs> cooperate. Thank you, Sophie, for that. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Hopefully there's been a lot of food for thought there. Um, so it'd be really interesting to get your views, and I'm sure the panel will be happy to, uh, to respond. So does anyone have any burning questions or comments? Yeah. You do as you want. Yeah. Uh, I'm Sophia. I would like a bit more about uh, your new platform. It, it's uh, a whole cloud system, or 
get the client's uh, single instance on a server. I think I will let Alex <laughs> more of the technical side. So we be we do both actually. We build a framework so that you can use to build your own app, and we also providing an, an collaborative platform ourselves. So you you can join and deploy your own instance. So you can do both. If you want to create your own custom app, then you use a framework and you enjoy yourself with it. And if, if the, co the collaboration app we built suits your need, then you can deploy an, an instance on your own or trust us and we host it for you. OK. Uh, does it have single sign-on for eventually the ID system, LDAP? We, we so far we based ourselves on open ID standard. Ah, so okay. the, an the answer is yes. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Question there. Uh, um, we use web components. I don't know if I answer the question. Um, I, I suppose I was thinking the kind of microservices you might put into a container and ship to other places if other people wanted to set up or use a container to set up their own and put it out on a, 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 a cloud server somewhere. Um, I, I don't know if you see what a web component is, but it's um, an extension of the HTML protocol and it allows you to, to uh, define your own tags. And so basically the video tags in HTML5, you can consider it as a web component. And so what we do is we build our own. For example, you, we have an SIB chat component. You enter this in your page and boom, you, you get a full-fledged chat application within your app. Is that with JavaScript and HTML? Yes, yes. Is, is there a question there or are you on? Can <laughs> <laughs> Stretching. It's a stretch. Okay. Um, does anyone else have a, have, a, have a question for the panel? Or have you, has everyone felt like, wow, we've got a full uh, explanation there, and we're all going to go and start um, building and playing with some of these tools? Is there any work being done on the semantic web in any of your work here? Yes. What we do is like we, we actually assemble several protocols. One is uh, the protocols of linked data that allows us to publish data in a standardized way and we add the semantic web uh, protocols on top of it so that our components are able to understand data providing from other applications and that's actually how we, bri we bridge several applications together without having to construct particular APIs through particular apps. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes? So the answer is yes, we do. It's fully based on semantic web. Cool. And I think we've got a question over here just on our left. I actually do have a question now. Um, so there's two very different approaches. I'm not from a technical you know, background. So as I understand it, there seems to be two different approaches to the problem. So there's a... Yes. There's the silos uh, and um, breaking the silos through um, creating one's own apps. And then there's, no, we need to work on scale uh, through similar centralized, but centralized, centri cent what I mean by centralized there is that everybody's using them, but they're decentralized in design. I appreciate that, yeah. So how do you relate to each other? Is there a tension? Or is there a biodiversity, or is there a compatibility? Or? Well, I, I, well, we have been meeting for breakfast, and we have been <laughs> having a, we, we didn't a, fight. a <laughs> video conference before. So we try to f learn about each other's projects. I think that's the enriching thing. Uh, but let's take maybe a step back. Uh, 10 years ago, or 15, when Web 2.0 started, Right? Uh, we thought, wow, uh, free software and open source is much better, and we will win. And we didn't, right? Now, the web is much more uh, centralized than it was ever before. So, um, we need to make sure that we can interoperate at least, that we can see this diversity of models, uh, uh, and that we experiment, and that we build our own uh, collaborative, cooperative clouds uh, that should be sustainable 
and interoperable so that you don't need to um, be part again of 10 different projects, 10 different accounts, because otherwise people will just stay with Google and friends, right? Or enemies, how you call them. Um, there is also the thing about the sustainability. And I think we should discuss about that as well. How do we foresee that our projects are sustainable? Um, we have seen so many interesting um, GNU social or wikis or other servers that uh, one or a few guys have set up. And then people have been using it, and after a while, they're dead, right? And they're not continued because the one person that started it, well, he changed his mind and he has now other obligations. So there was no sustainability model. There was no collective ownership of the project. And that's really tricky. That's really an issue. So uh, I think all three projects here have different uh, ways of, of working with the sustainability. Um, but I think we should be asking ourselves, how is that? How do we make sure that our projects still exist next year and the year after, and that the users that we do it for, that they are there, that they are with us, right? That it's their project. Uh, cool. Uh, my question is, have you guys heard of uh, Conway's Law? It's basically the idea that uh, eventually every software company ships their internal communication structure. So. Uh, my suggestion would be that if you want to continue interoperating, you have to continue sort of communicating in like a, in more of a sort of in a communication institution, something like that. Okay. Yeah. So, anyone want to pick up on that one? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Um, Maybe you can explain it better. Well, yeah, yeah, I think that's what somehow we try to do, right? I mean, uh, to work bottom up, to have these co creation sessions. Do we really need this or that, or what kind of needs do we have? So, um, what kind of existing projects do we select, or do we create something from scratch? or what components can we reuse, all these steps. And, and then the next step, that our f handle our users so that they join uh, our projects and that they feel comfortable about it and that it's theirs and that they uh, decide and are co-owners as we, uh, or members, or uh, I think some, I don't know how your project works exactly. How does that, how does that work? Are the, your users also co-owners of the project or how is that? Yes, in, in France we have um, a legal entity that's called the SCIC and it allows, a it's a multi-shareholder multi cooperative and through that we are able to include our clients and also our investors. Yeah, so that's similar to what we set up possibly, right? A multi-stakeholder kind of cooperative? Yes, yes, it is. So one of the things that I've noticed um, when we kind of moved from free software that was something you download and run on your own computer to free software that's running on a server or in the quote-unquote cloud um, somewhere else, that it, it adds another lo level of complexity to the sustainability problem. So you've got the sustainability of the group that's actually developing the software, so that's one layer of, of um, skilled people you've got to sustain and, and keep them working, keep them fed and housed and watered. And then um, the people who are actually deploying the software for the users, um, whether that's in a giant cloud infrastructure or, or just one little instance on a, on a desktop machine at home, however that's organised, the deployment layer also has to be sustained, which is what Wuta was referring to before. So then, um, I think there's a really interesting coordination problem, um, and particularly when money comes into it, between the developing organisation and the deploying organisations, because the deploying organisations are the ones that have contact with the users. So they've got the best opportunity to maybe collect memberships or, or fees or um, collect money from users. So then, um, but they're dependent on the work being done by the developers. So how, how do you, any of you or all of you, see um, developing that relationship between deployers and developers and making sure the money 
flows to where it's needed mm-hmm. if, if, when it becomes available? Can have different I, takes on that one? I think it's a very good question. Our model, we really look at what Automatic is doing with WordPress. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but basically they are the main contributor to WordPress for free software. And they also own WordPress.com and it's the most used uh, hosting service for WordPress websites. And they make shit lots of money and it's cool for them. And we basically intend to replicate this model, like to to be a main contributor to the source code, that, but and also to also sell customized development services on the software. But the hosting is supposed to be our main revenue within three years. So we couple it together. <coughs> I, I think that's a very interesting question. WordPress are a very good example. Their software is GPL. So I don't know if people here are aware of the differences between kind of open source software licenses, but but they're not all the same. Um, The GPL that WordPress uses and Discourse uses and Nextcloud uses is a software license that enforces sharing. It uses copyright law to force people to share the code and ensure that the code remains in the commons forever. So it's quite restrictive in as much as sharing is enforced. The other, what are now more popular software licenses are the ones that the corporations like. So they like the BSD X11 MIT style licenses. And these are more liberal because they allow you to privatize the code. Okay, so Google loves these licenses, Facebook loves these licenses, so does Microsoft. And that's the model that um, GitLab has. They've, they've, they've had quite a lot of venture capital funding. Their code is licensed under one of these liberal licenses. I can't remember which one now. It's probably the MIT or Apache license. And that means that although there is a free community edition you can download and run on your server, There's also a paid for commercial version that isn't free software that you can buy as a service from them. And that's a slightly different model from WordPress and Nextcloud and Discourse. WordPress, Nextcloud, Discourse, they all provide a very good hosting service for their software and they have GPL software. Um, GitLab, they provide a hosting service but but their software is, is, is one of these more permissive licenses. But so it's similar yeah. business models, but slightly different as well. Very interesting question. I wanted to make two comments. Uh, the first, um, I think we've seen that we cannot just say that the users take up the software and run it without any help. But most users can, don't do that. That's what we have believed in that it would work and it didn't. Um, the second, how do we organize? So we are this alliance and we have open team meetings, one developer team meeting on Wednesdays and one coordination meeting on Fridays. Um, and we have our own project management fabricator platform where we uh, keep the tasks of the, the core development and then we have specific tasks on uh, you help this collective migrate or uh, etc. all these kind of things. Um, we allow, we encourage people to contribute to translations and other kinds of um, peer production and peer learning help in the community. We have also this Discourse Agora website where people can express wh- why they join the project, what kind of needs they have, well, if the, how they help, uh, suggestions they make and help the project uh, in itself or other people. Uh, so this Peer contribution is really important, also monetarily, that we encourage people for the making donations. And we have SEPA um, um, commitments that, that we, um, how do you call that, the, the direct debits that people can, that we can automate the, the contributions for them according to what they want. Um, but of course, uh, the whole problem is how to have this base team uh, have some some sustainable level so that we can have a team that we can rely on. It's still a challenge. We really need to work hard in the coming months on that. So I think we've, we haven't got any more time, I'm afraid, because I think we have to finish at 11.45 because there's another session coming in. But 
you all you got all of you are going into the open space straight after this. So if you want to keep the discussion going, that's a bit more of an intimate space to um, go into a bit more detail. Um, so, but first of all, can I just thank the panel in this session? Uh, so a round of applause, please. <laughs>